With the parable of the pounds, we come to the second parable in Christ's last week on earth, and the last parable that he uttered before entering Jerusalem for the final time. From Luke 19, part of which we read earlier, we see Christ's route to the holy city on his final trip there. In verse 1, he's in Jericho. Then he journeys up and west by Bethphage and Bethany. Verse 29, he comes to the bottom of the Mount of Olives, verse 37, before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey on what's called Palm Sunday. And so the parable of the pounds, like the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, which we considered last week, was delivered when Christ was near Jerusalem, the shadow of the cross was lengthening. So it is that both parables deal in slightly different ways with the final judgment. And both contain a sting, as we shall see later, especially with the servant who wrapped his pound in a napkin. Now the parables of the pounds this week and the laborers in the vineyard last Sunday morning differ in the images that they used to portray the kingdom of heaven. Last week dealt with metaphors from the realm of agriculture, the vineyard. The parable of the pounds concerns the world of business and trading. To gain money through dealing for business. Let's then consider together the parable of the pounds. First, the powerful story. Second, the eschatological teaching. And third, the three groups. The parable of the pounds. The powerful story, the eschatological teaching, and the three groups. Now the dominant and pivotal character in the parable of the pounds is the nobleman or lord. The story itself is divided into two parts. Look with me in your Bibles at this parable. First of all, we have the lords going away and entrusting work to his servants. In verses 12 through 14, at the very start of the parable, a short portion. Second, we have the nobleman's coming back in order to judge and reward his servants from verse 15 to verse 27 at the end of the parable, the main lengthy chunk of this word of God. This is our first look at the parable in a broad overview. We have the nobleman or lord departing, leaving work for his servants, 12 through 14, the short bit at the start, and then he returns and rewards or punishes his servants from verse 15 through verse 27. With that general overview in mind, let's descend into the details. The nobleman, or the Lord, being informed that he is to be invested with a kingdom, journeys afar off to receive his realm from his overlord. Before he leaves, however, he calls together his servants. Here is a pound for each of you. And the pound here isn't 100 UK pennies. A pound here means roughly three months wages for a standard man. Three months wages, so depending on what you ascertain a standard yearly pay is, it could be four or five or six or seven or eight thousand pounds in our money. Here you have this money. Now do business, trade with this money, put it to good use, 
And then when I come back, I will reward you accordingly for your use of my money. But the nobleman was not the only person or party that was journeying to the overlord. The citizens of the nobleman's land hated him. And so they sent an embassage to the emperor, we will not have this man to reign over us. Make somebody else ruler, but not him. And evidently, their message failed of its desired effect, for the nobleman was indeed installed as king. Many days later, the nobleman returned from his long journey as the king, and as he had promised, he calls his servants to account. The first servant appears. Lord, you give me one pound, here are ten pounds. Well done. Good, faithful servant. You can rule over ten cities. Second servant comes. Lord, your one pound made five pounds. Very good. You can have five cities. I'm the king, I appoint you over ten, and you over five in my realm. And then almost all, the remainder of the parable, is concerned with the next servant, and the king's dealings with him. The first two servants are given two verses each, 16 and 17, and 18 and 19. But the wicked servant, he gets almost twice as much treatment as the other two servants put together. Lord, he says to him, here is your pound, all neatly wrapped up here in this handkerchief. And if you ask me why I didn't put it to proper use, my answer is, well, I know the sort of Lord you are. You're a severe man. You reap what you didn't sow. So I was afraid, I was scared. So I didn't try and do anything with your money. This is your money, I'm giving it back to you. And the king is angry with his servant. How dare you say this about me? You could at the very least have gotten off your backside and done something with it. At least gone to the bank and invested the money and I would have some interest, or usury, as it's called in our text. So the pound of this servant, which was unfruitful, didn't earn anything, is then taken from the wicked servant, and given to the servant with ten pounds, with this word, verse 26, unto every one which hath shall be given. They'll get more. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him, so that he gets nothing. And the parable closes with the king's judgment upon his enemies, those mentioned near the start, who proclaimed, we will not have this man to rule over us. Of them, the king says, those my enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, Bring them here and slay them before me. That's the parable. Now the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, some of you will have heard of him, the ancient historian Josephus tells us that something very like what is recorded in verses 12 and 14 actually had happened in Judea about 30 years before the events of Luke 19.